lots of things to tell you. Uh, in 25 minutes, I don't know if I can do justice, so I will prioritize. And I don't want to speak fast, much as I would have loved to give my speech in French. I'm sorry, I would not have been able to do justice to the topic that I would cover. But I can understand, uh, not, not too bad. So I always like to use any opportunity to talk to an audience like this. Five minutes about two aspects about my company, the Tata Group. I think Professor Math explained to you about Jaguar Land Rover, and I saw the Tata logo many times there. And I think many of you know about the Tata Group as uh, a car company. But there are some numbers there, like we are a hundred billion dollar company. Sixty percent of our revenues comes from outside of India, so it is a truly international company, headquartered in Bombay, of course, but it is very international. We operate in seven big sectors, and we, we, we are quite the leader in some of those sectors uh, across the world or definitely in some countries. The Tata Group, for example, is the largest private sector employer in the UK. Not many people know that. Of course, it is very large in India. We are about 480,000 people totally, employees of the Tata Group slightly larger than Sodexo, if I may say. But leave aside all these numbers, 100, 100 billion, 60% international, seven sectors, 110 companies, leave all of that. Two things about the Tata Group, I like to use any opportunity to explain about it. One is the shareholding structure of the group. Even though the holding company is called Tata Sons, and it looks like a very family-oriented company, just 2% of the holding is by anyone having the name Tata. There are others who have 10%, uh, 12%. There is one other group. But otherwise, 67% of the shareholding of this holding company is actually charitable trusts. So this is a unique arrangement because while we as individual companies, all the 110 companies, we are very competitive in the market. We are a for-profit company. We don't do charity. Of course, we have our own corporate social responsibility budget <clears throat> under which we do charitable work and so on. But as a company, we are for-profit, we are highly competitive, and we mean business. And we want to give best value and service to our customers. But all the profits that these individual companies make, when they get paid as dividends to the holding company, it is actually to run hospitals, educational institutes, laboratories, research and development, giving uh, donations to various institutions. So this, I think, is a true definition of what is called a social enterprise. And this thing resonates, especially in France, France having a lot of commitment to social equity, this aspect of the Tata group, I always use any opportunity to explain. This is one point. The second point about the Tata group is the trust with which this company is held across the world. There is a group called Reputation Institute, and they do surveys of more than 300,000 companies across the world and they publish ranking of most trusted companies in the world. And the last survey they did, they ranked the Tata Group as the 11th most trusted company in the world. In the world. You cannot buy this ranking. By definition, Reputation Institute has a reputation to keep. They have a very audited methodology by which they do the survey. And we are very happy to be in the 11th across the world. Given that, as Professor Math was saying, India is a very mysterious country. It has all those bureaucracy invented by the French but perfected by India. <laughs> <laughs> and 
and uh, corruption. You know, uh, there is a corruption perception index which is also done, I think, uh, by some global organization, UN or World Bank, and they rank India quite low in that. It's, uh, I think, about 90, 95 in the ranking as most corrupt company, most corrupt country. Just imagine in a situation where you have to operate in such an environment with bureaucracy and corruption, the company, the Tata Group, and it's not just one company in Tata Group or five companies in Tata Group. It is the entire Tata Group is ranked as 11th most trusted company, uh, company in the world. So those are two things about the Tata Group I always like to explain. Now, about Tata Consultancy Services, the company I represent, and I have been in this company now for 20 years. Um, many of you wouldn't have heard maybe about it. But we are also very large. We are among the big four, just like there used to be this big six and that became big four and so on for the accounting and auditing industry. There is a ranking that is published by Brand Finance of the big four in the IT across the world. And TCS ranks among the big four as a brand, which is that if I were to take the name TCS to the market and I was to auction it amongst you and you were all to bid for it, you would bid $5 billion to just have the name TCS to buy the name. And that puts us amongst the top four of IT brands in the world. So this is on the branding side. We are about 280,000 people across the world. Um, we do about $12 billion of turnover. But an interesting point about the TCS company, I want all of you to know, is one figure there, which is 98.6%. And what does that represent? It is every year we grow by about 15 to 20%, depending on a good year or bad year. And uh, if we increase by $2 billion in a year, it means 98.6% of that $2 billion is coming from our existing customers. So we have large banks, large retailers, large utilities as our customers, and every year we are growing in those same accounts, which shows to you, beyond all those numbers, 12 billion, 280,000 people operating in 44 countries, it doesn't matter. It is the trust that our customers have in us which represents that 98.6% repeat business that comes every year from them. So this is about TCS. TCS in France. We have been here for a long time. We have been there since 1992. But we were represented by an agency. So we were not directly present in France. And um, for a long time it was like that. And in 2006, we decided to become direct and we bought over that agency. We acquired that company. But then the cri that was 2007. And then the crisis was there, and everyone was conserving cash, so we also conserved it. But in 2009, end of 2009, we recognized that the time for investment in France has come again. And we started investing a lot more in France, and we hired more than 150 people here. We got a lot of new customers. And uh, we opened up a center in Lille. We expanded our office in France. We did major events here. We started executing projects and got a lot of experience in doing projects, large projects in France. And that created a very good management pool for us. And we did something very big earlier this year. In uh, April, we announced the acquisition of a French company here. And in July 1st, we actually merged. Uh, we, we bought the company. It is about 1,200 people in France. It's a company called Alti. And right now, we are in the heart of the integration project. It is going very well, I must say, and a lot of positive effects. And we have had our major successes in jointly winning projects in some very large groups. And I'm sure some of you may be working in those large groups. So it's a, it's a pleasure to tell you this very positive news. We are right now hiring. We have a target that by end of December, we want to hire more than 170 net new people in France, which means there was some likely attrition that will happen. And to manage that, I want to hire nearly 200, 210 people. 
so that I remain at, I have a net of 170. So that is about TCS, Tata Group and um, uh, TCS in France. It is a very interesting place to uh, work. So definitely, I, I want to use this opportunity to say that. Now, what is about the topic of today? Services innovation that comes from Asia. I will give some personal examples. I personally joined TCS in India, of course. I worked in different cities in India for the first seven years. I was in Chennai, Mumbai, Pune, Kolkata. They're all geographically very different places. I worked for seven years in different places. In 2001, I raised my hand and said, I want to work outside of India. And I got a first chance to work in Singapore. And I went there as a business development manager. So I was a sales guy. And I was there for one year. And then I became the head of that country. I was the country manager for TCS in France. I was there for four years. At the end of 2004, I said, I would like a Western Hemisphere experience now. So I raised my hand and said. And I had an opportunity to move to the US. And I became the client manager or the client partner for one of our big banking accounts. And I was there for five years. And uh, it was a very successful period for me because that, that client grew. We were about 550 people. And uh, when I left, we were about 4,500 people. And now we have 6,000 people working for that one client. Uh, then in uh, 2009, when it was becoming very comfortable working in that, that bank, I said, I would like a European experience. And I said, uh, I would like to move. So they gave me two choices. They said, you could be either in Germany or you could be in France. And I'm very happy I chose France. And I've been here for the last uh, three and a half years. Uh, I had a target that I should learn French in the first six months. <laughs> it is the biggest disappointment I have on myself that I still have not become good enough to speak, even though I can understand, especially when people speak slowly, use simple words and avoid the subjunctive. <laughs> uh, believe me, in this integration, I am forced to learn it uh, because all the works council meeting and the steering committee meetings, all of that happens in French. So this is uh, my personal experience. And now I will relate to services and innovation that comes from uh, Asia. The first one is, and I think Professor Math also referred, there are some technologies that are out there that have allowed TCS to be disruptive in one particular type of service, which is the technology service. They say with the internet and with all the telecommunication network and bandwidths that have come, uh, they say geography has become history now. And we started this process in 1974, when our first client was in the US, it was the Detroit Police Department. And we started doing work for them from Detroit and Bombay. And uh, we would send tapes by Air India flights to Detroit. And all the specifications would come in documents or facts. And as the internet uh, uh, expanded, as the bandwidth expanded, we started doing it through established links. And we started pioneering this model. And you will ask me, what does this model mean? You know, when you take a piece of requirement from a customer, and you are able to break it up into work packages, and you are able to then determine what work package can be done anywhere in the world, and what needs to be done inside the client location, next to the client, that takes understanding. And different companies, different countries have different ways of working. So you need to perfect this understanding almost every day. Because as I said, it's not just a country or a uh, region. It is every company has its distinct way of working. And you can bring your models to work on this offshore model, but you have to perfect it for that customer for that company. And this, I think, we do very well. And that is how many companies in the West 
including France, are using India as a services location for either technology or business process. And increasingly now to what is called knowledge processes, where you do analytics and domain rich uh, processes. Companies have been coming initially to India because of cost. So they get a much lower labor arbitrage. The word for that is labor arbitrage. They come to India for cost. But after a period of time, they start seeing the quality. And they remain in India because of quality. And after a while, now we are at a pretty advanced stage in the third stage of that, which is investing in innovation. So this is, again, a very important thing you need to know. Companies came to India for cost. They continue to be there for quality. And now they are investing in innovation. TCS has fantastic case studies in all three of this. And some of our case studies actually show this history. So the history of IT in India is actually the history of TCS. And many of our case studies are like that. They came to us for cost. Then they remained and grew for quality. And now we have innovation labs, innovation days, um, centers of excellence, some of them dedicated to some customers, some of them mutualized for some customers. And there are a lot of examples of the kind of innovation we bring. Professor Math also explained about uh, some of the services in Singapore Airlines. We are very proud to say that it has been a long-standing customer for us, for all, most of all their application set. And for British Airways, we have a dedicated lab for them, which we created in joint collaboration with them. And we have created so many solutions out of that. British Airways gets to use them first right, but then we are also taking it to other airline <laughs> customers. Here, there, this is where the India advantage comes. Someone from TCS in India, he goes to work in the US for maybe a large bank. He comes back to India and is part of the offshore team for that same bank for, say, one year. Then he goes to a bank in Australia. He comes back. He goes to a bank in France. He comes back. So like that, you have several people who have traveled around the world, and they come back. And that knowledge, which is now concentrated in India, is then an experience which is shared, and better solutions, innovative solutions are created, mutualized, productized, and then taken back to the same customers and they get a lot of value because of that. So TCS has many products in the banking sector, retail sector, insurance sector, government sector, all of that which comes out of a global experience. We, we do not claim, even though sometimes we are, we do not claim to be the expert banker in France or the expert in retail merchandising in UK. But we have an outside-in perspective where we know how merchandising is done in India, in uh, Japan, in Australia, in UK. And many times, it is the same guy who was sometimes part of these projects. And the experience and value he brings is tremendous. So this is something on services innovation. TCS has revolutionized it, pioneered it. And this whole thing is a case study, in fact, in INSEAD also, how TCS and, and in Harvard, how TCS did a service model disruption in the world of IT outsourcing. And many companies which had very comfortable relationships, very cozy relationships with their customers, but who were not delivering value, they were becoming complacent. They were having such a relationship with customers that customers could never think of breaking out of them they suddenly woke up to this wave from India. And now, if you know, all those companies in the West, IT companies in the West, their largest employee base is now in India. CAP, for example, IBM, for example, Accenture, for example. You take your, their entire organization employee strength, and you see their India percentage. It is the largest, in some cases, even more than 50%. This is one example of services innovation that I think uh, TCS has brought. 
switching to another area, because you are not only interested to know about outsourcing and IT and so on, happy to answer any questions on that. But switching to another topic on this is, uh, what are the other services that are being done in India, which maybe is more global, which can be taken to the globe? Firstly, anything in India has to be at a bigger scale um, because sheer demographics. And some of the solutions you have to take to India have to operate at a cost which is significantly lower than what you would have done in a developed nation. This, there are many examples, huh? uh, TCS examples, non-TCS examples. I will give you a couple of things that TCS is doing and a couple which others are doing. Firstly, on agriculture and fisheries, as Professor Math said, it is still a major industry, you know, unlike 6% in, in France or less than that in France, the sector that works in agriculture is nearly 30%. So a lot of poor people, small land holdings, very uneconomical scale. So, but they need access to information. They need to become efficient. And we have created technology-based solutions for them, which makes them more efficient. They can access information on weather patterns. They can access information on the market prices, not in just in the nearest market, but in surrounding regions. So now the farmer has control over where to sell. He is not dependent on the middleman, as they say. And uh, earlier he was always a slave to the middleman, and now technology has allowed him to free himself of the middleman, who was eating the maximum margin, not the farmer. And now the power has shifted. There is a, a mobile-based application we devised. It is already successfully running for farmers. Now we have taken it and uh, put it for fishermen. So now it is not just weather patterns, but it will also advise you what is the best time to go out to fish because you can maximize the catch. So this is one example. Similarly for health, again, India, it has planet scale problems in that continent. We are a continent by ourselves, you know, 1.1 billion people. Uh, with uh, 28 states and seven uh, territories. So it's about 32 different uh, regions, each of them having its own legislature, parliament, each state having its own parliament, mostly own language, different type of food. The clothes we wear in different states are different. The food we eat are different. The way we conduct marriage, birthday, anniversary, death functions, they are different. The gods that we pray to are different. So it is a continent by itself. And many of these problems, poverty, access to health, access to education, it is important for us to address it at India level and at each state level. So again, TCS does a lot of work on this. And why I'm saying this is because some of the things that we do there is applicable for other countries, not in France maybe, but in Africa, in other parts of Asia. And the South-South cooperation, I think it is greatly enabled because of that. For example, we have an adult literacy program, which we have created a functional, functional literacy module. You don't learn grammar in that program. You don't learn the root meaning of words in that program. You don't learn complex usage and phrases and verbs. You learn how to go to a bank and cash a check. You learn how to go and do shopping. You learn how to go and fill up a form at a government uh, office. And there is this module which is digitized in almost all the languages in India, outside of India in Spanish and two African languages. And this is being used by voluntary agencies to roll out literacy across India. And this is part of our mission. All of this is done free of cost by TCS in India. And the software is free for
for any NGO, non-government organization to take and deploy wherever they want. We of course give them the starter kit and some training around that. So while this is all to help India and maybe other regions which are similar to India, like in Nigeria, like, a, like other population centers which are heavy, and uh, there is one aspect about it which I think is relevant for even Western nations, which is that most of the solutions that we are developing is on the latest, latest, latest technology. Because we had the good fortune of maybe missing the earlier waves of technology. So when mainframes were there, we had just two mainframes in 1974 uh, in the whole of India. And we missed that. Banks, insurance companies, they were resisting computerization. And there was a big socialist uh, trend in the government where it said, no, we, we should keep all of this job destructing uh, devices out of India. So we missed that bus of mainframes, of client servers. And when India opened up in 91, slowly all of this opened up. And now most of the solutions we are developing are on the latest, latest, on cloud, using social media, accessible by mobile devices, using all sort of analytics and smart devices to do sensor monitoring and two-way communications. And this, therefore, are solutions now you may not be able to lift and drop because the Western world, the companies already have big legacy systems. And how do you bring in all of this inside an existing legacy? But all of this is where the first innovation I said comes in, where we have the processes, the data migration tools, the service um, uh, migration tools, the architectural consulting to bring these new solutions set into existing legacy. So this is about TCS. Now, let me give you some examples on other aspects. Uh, Firstly, you all may have, maybe you have heard about, maybe, maybe you have heard because all of you have gone through advanced degree programs and it must have, might have been a case study. It is a case study in some of the business schools in the US about uh, the lunch box distribution in Bombay. Bombay is a city with more than 16 million population. And it is a very narrow city. The city is not sprawling like Paris. It is uh, narrow like this because it comes like this and it's an island. It's a peninsula like that. So it's a very long city. So distance for traveling is very high, commuting. So people have to leave their house at about 7, 7.15 to reach their office uh, by 9, 9.30 and so on. And the Indians love hot homemade lunch, but they can't have their wives getting up at 5 o'clock, cooking and packing it so that he can take it with him at 7, and by then it is cold. So there is this set of people in Bombay whose only job is to go at 10, 30, 11 to all these houses in the suburbs who pick up these lunch boxes, <clears throat> which have color coding on them, color and numeric coding on them label and it is a very complex supply chain because it has to be picked up from several places and all of them have to go and get distributed in several office towers, thousands of office towers across uh, the south of Bombay, which is the office commercial complex. They operate at six sigma efficiency, which means in one million boxes, six goes wrong. It is a classic case study, uh, the, and it is not an organization with one CEO, with a board of directors, and so on. It is just a lot of people who came together, set it up as a cooperative, and they operated. And the head of that cooperative was invited to speak at uh, Harvard, and uh, he won some awards on that. All of this using processes, and they didn't learn Six Sigma from GE. They just operated at that level. And then they said, oh, you are a Six Sigma certified. <laughs> so you see all of these innovations coming from India. There are lots more like this. In TCS, we took some basic available technology and created, five years ago, it was the biggest supercomputer in Asia. 
until China bought a computer and it became the biggest one. But otherwise, five years ago, without importing any supercomputer chipset with available chipsets in the market, TCS created the largest supercomputer in Asia. Similarly, in Tata Power, two engineers because in India, power is also a big problem. Education, health, power, access to food, food, spoilage, all of these are problems. Power distribution is a big problem. And when there is wastage in the transmission, theft and wastage, it is a big issue. And Tata Power, two engineers, they came up with a software-based solution to distribute power to minimize transmission losses. They never talked about it. They just did it. And then uh, the chief operating officer of Tata Power heard about it and said, why don't you write a paper? And they wrote a paper. And they submitted it to a, their body, the, whatever is the industry body for these electrical engineers. And that paper got selected to be presented at their international conference, which happened last year in Paris. So simple things that we do, which we sometimes don't recognize ourselves, get international acclaim. Siemens, when they set up their research lab in India, and they were developing some um, uh, devices for scanning, you know, uh, body scans. In India, the cost of that to get the same precision picture was so high, it couldn't have been sold in India. So some engineers working in that company, they came up with a software-based solution to perfect the image. So it is using some cheaper lens, but you take it and use software to perfect the image and maintain the verity of the image. And now that solution, they are incorporating into their products across the world. So similarly, another medical devices company, and there's a TCS project. They wanted to launch a stapler, medical stapler in India. You know, you have wounds, you just take. And the cost of that, for India was not affordable for the vast population of India. So we did a project for them. How can we make this affordable for the people in India? Of course, we looked at replacing some materials. Of course, we looked at local sourcing. Of course, we looked at uh, innovative design so that ease of manufacture is simplified and so on. Of course, we did all of that. But can one of you guess what really made the difference in price. We brought the price down by one by five times. So if it was 10, it became two. Can one of you try to imagine what could have been the solution there? In the West, people use these staplers and they throw it away. It is never reused. What we did was we perfected a model for reuse which meant we had to redesign the stapler so that it was easy to be sanitized, sterilized in the same type of sterilization equipment that would be available in a normal clinic in India. Not the sophisticated, big, large hospitals, but a sterilization equipment in a normal hospital in India. And because of that design, we are able to reuse that stapler after sterilization three times. And that brought the price down by one by fifth time. There is also a very funny example of reuse. Uh, it's really not a services innovation, but you could say that. Uh, restaurants in India serve a very interesting drink called lassi. It's, uh, many of you have heard of this. It's, it's, uh, yeah. And uh, it's a very complex process. You have to mix it. You have to do a lot of mixing to get the real consistent feel of it. And depending upon the flavors, you have to mix it a long time. It was a labor-intensive process. And you have these mixers, which you can use to save on time, but then the, it's not very effective. It is a market out there where somebody could have come up with a lassi making machine and sold it to so many food stall vendors across India. It's such a popular drink, especially in the north. But you know what some enterprising people did? They just bought a washing machine. And they converted that washing machine into a lassi making machine. <laughs> of course, it's not that in the night they use it for washing machine and day they <laughs> please don't worry about it. But these are 
uh, frugal innovation. I think all of you may have seen some words like that, frugal innovation. There is a word in India also for that called jugad, where what is the appropriate use of technology to actually deliver better customer satisfaction at a price for the below the pyramid. And it's a big issue for us at the below the pyramid. And I think Professor Math also had a deck on Unilever where they reduced the size of the chassis. There is an issue on washing clothes. You know, all the soaps that you see are soft on all sides, all uh, eight sides. So when you start washing, it gets rubbed off. So Hindustan Lever, the division there, they just decided to hard coat one of the surface so that you can maximize the use till the end. So simple things, simple product designs make big difference in the cost of servicing the large population in India. And many of these ideas from India are applicable throughout the world, throughout the world. That's about it. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, uh, discussion on uh, on uh, TCS and Tata in general, and I learned a lot. And I'm I'm sure that uh, recently we'll have to come back to SEC main campus to also explain to the students in general. Now I understand you ma may have to leave earlier than okay. planned. So as opposed to what we do usually, uh, which is to push the question for the to the end, uh, we might handle like one question now. So, si y a quelques questions, il faudrait les évoquer maintenant, contrairement à ce qu'on fait habituellement, parce que euh, euh, Monsieur euh, Narayanan ne, ne peut pas rester toute la matinée. Euh, oui, on repousse les questions plus tard. Mais depuis, là, depuis longtemps. Mais, euh, non, mais tout, I'm sorry to do this, but I really have to. I have to leave for a flight to India. C'est très, compré ben, yeah, yeah. très compréhensible. Est-ce qu'il y, est qu y a des questions immédiates euh, qu'il qu qu ne faudrait pas louper? Euh, c'est vrai qu'il y en a beaucoup. La difficulté, c'est d'avoir la première. C'est toujours pareil. Oui, merci. Thank you very much. I was very interested in the lunchbox uh, innovation. Is there some site where this is explained, where we have details on it? Uh, you can search in Google for Dabawala. You write it Dabawala. D H A D H D H A yeah. B H A okay. W A L L A H. Yeah. Daba means lunch box and Wala means the lunch box guys. So it literally means Daba Wala. Search on it, you will get it. <coughs> I will write it for you. Uh, could you. Maybe you could write it here? No, I could write it there. Literally means the lunchbox boys. Kuna, yes, yes. Uh, thank you very much for your uh, very uh, inspiring speech, uh, Kuna. I have a question uh, regarding your own experience. You've been traveling throughout the world in different continents, different culture. You know, uh, it's four years, almost through four years, you're in France. What can you say about how important is the culture regarding innovation? You mentioned a lot about India. What's your view on the French culture uh, and its role in innovation? Uh, it, it is important. I agree. Culture definitely is a very important construct. And uh, to give you the context, that is precisely the reason that we decided to invest and buy this company. We paid $75 million for that company. Um, it's a fantastic company, and we feel it is important because we have to address the culture. All that global experience we have back in India, it is mostly in English. But the French, if they have to tap into that global experience, they have to do it. And we have an obligation to bring it to them in an easy manner. And that is the reason why we have this 1,200 more people now who can be the ambassadors for this global experience. So we recognize the need for cultural proximity and, um, uh, and its relation to doing business, including innovation. Now, it's a very, sometimes I don't want to get into stereotypical uh, you know, situational answers, but 
people ask that is one culture more innovative than other and so on. I do not have a, a statistical view of it uh, or a personal view of it. Uh, I, I feel that it is all about openness and if, if people are open to new ideas streaming into their minds, then they become more innovative, out of the box thinking and uh, all of that. And I feel in France, France has been a country which has created so many technologies. Uh, it is, uh, for example, some of the film, in the film industry, the way when a ball rolls, how the shadow of that ball should also follow the rolling ball when it is animated uh, was a design done by, uh, in France. Similarly, Alcatel, they created some fantastic technologies on two-way radio communications. Um, so all of, uh, and there's so much on nuclear field, on tunneling, on fast uh, trains and so on. So it has been a very innovative uh, country. So I don't, for one moment, uh, I would say that another country has been more innovative than France and so on. If France needs to continue on its trend of innovation, I think now it is time to also be open to new ideas coming from wherever and uh, cycling it into the innovation engine, which already France has an experience of. So I think France is quite innovative. I think in terms of value, the, uh, the importance of inventing and the importance of creativity in the mind of the people always been there and, and still is there. But the implementation is sometimes more laborious because it's less uh, in, uh, in our culture, I believe. Une dernière question, peut-être On sait éventuellement. Hein? Oui. Alexandra Domar. Thank you very much, Kudmar. My question is, uh, I worked for a large French financial service group. I went abroad. I came back to France. It was as if I had never gone. I had changed a lot, but uh, and I happened to come back in a very similar job, and people thought I'd been abroad to learn a new language. It was kind of a vacation. <laughs> My question is, how do you, and it, it happens for a lot of people around that go in different cultures and live things and come back to head office and you missed a bit of the political rat race. How does uh, Tata manage to exploit, uh, you talked to the, you used the term ambassador for people who go abroad. How, how can they come back and share their experience? You know, TCS is uh, a little different from uh, maybe uh, a bank. The reason being that our work is on-site work needs a particular type of skill. Offshore work needs a particular type of skill. On-site, you need to have skill of client interaction, managing expectations, capturing requirements which are very fuzzy and then making it clean cut so that it can be sent to developers in India to code. At offshore, you need different kind of, kind of experience. You need how to manage large teams, young people uh, who, who are coming from homes which are far off, not very, um, uh, not very well developed as you are used to comforts here, but then they come into centers which are air conditioned, full fledged, state of the art, modern facilities, anything that somebody in France, France also would envy to work in that place. So you need that kind of people management, recruitment, hiring, as well as client management, but they are not client phasing skills. So it's different and when I, for example, I, I definitely will go back to India. And when I go, I will find a role which will leverage the experience I have had outside of India. So for me it is kind of, I feel it would be easy in a company like TCS because I would still be connected to some work that is happening either in France or in US and so on. Uh, so that connectivity continues to be there. Whereas in a bank like yours, maybe when you come back, you're sort of you know, out of the geography and you know, so it could be different. So I'm not able to exactly answer your question. Uh, but again, it's like in all large organizations, uh, you have to know the right people. And my advice to anyone in TCS who is going back to India, especially at senior levels is always find a landing zone. <laughs> Know where you are going. Finalize your role back in India before you take the plane and go there. <laughs> Thank you.
Thank you very much. Thank you.